Good morning, friends, <clears throat> and happy Easter. Easter is always doubly especially relevant to me because it was uh, Easter Sunday in 1967 that I first met Swami. And that was certainly a resurrection from lower qualities into <laughs> higher qualities that began at that time. So lest we think that the events of this week were long ago and far away, let's just close our eyes and imagine that we're one of a very small group of people, 12 people or so, and we're with Jesus or with Master. And last week on Sunday, we came into Jerusalem together and large crowds were gathered around having heard about all the miracles and they were all joyful and singing, throwing palm fronds in front of us as a way of kind of celebrating the entrance. And so we had that beautiful, glorious day and then a day or two passed and then on Tuesday, we came again with Jesus back into Jerusalem. And this time, Jesus didn't come kind of quietly and joyfully. He came to challenge the power structure, the worship, the priests who were leading people astray. And among other things, they were changing money in the temple and he came and he drove out the money changers. Now they were already upset with him, but this direct challenge, imagine yourself being there with master, with Jesus, when this took place. And uh, as you can well imagine, it must have been a difficult, confrontive, uh, perhaps challenging time for you, whether you were glad that he had done it or a little bit feeling that maybe he's overstepped his bounds this time. Nonetheless, it was, it was a, an unsettling event. And then two days later, on Thursday, you all came again and you celebrated Passover, a special dinner that all the Jews celebrate. And in that dinner, Jesus seemed somber. And he said these special words, broke the bread that is part of the celebration, the dinner. He said, this is my body, take it and eat it. And as he drunk, served the wine, drank the wine, he said, this is my blood, which has been shed for thee. Very strange way to celebrate this Passover feast. Then he said, one of you is going to betray me. And then right after dinner, he went to a garden, Garden of Gethsemane, because he wanted to pray deeply. Very somber moment. And he asked some of his close disciples to come with him and to stay awake and pray with him. But it was late at night. You weren't able to do that, <clears throat> fell asleep. And Jesus prayed, Lord, let this cup be taken from me, if that's possible. But I surrender my will to your will. Your, let your will be done, not my own. He prayed that way three times. <clears throat> And then he got up, again awakened you, and soldiers came and they took him away. This is Thursday night. On Friday, he was taken and tried and crucified and then taken to the tomb. Now it's Sunday and the events of Easter have happened. And as Jonica explained, we can open our eyes now. 
as Janaka explained, it must have been a very mixed time. Obviously, great joy in seeing Jesus and the fulfillment of all of the power and the promise that he had done. And yet, with a little bit of chagrin, I suppose, embarrassment of the fact that not only had you kind of not been able to participate fully, but you'd been filled with fear. One of his closest disciples denounced him or denied that they knew him three times that night. So you were ashamed of your fear and yet joyful in the, um, in the resurrection of Jesus. But as Janica explained, the consciousness of Jesus was not that at all. He was coming to bless you. Jesus had been a man. He had been gone through all the trials of any human being, all of the delusions, all of the difficulties, the tests, the trials, because as Master explained, he had to have gone through all these great masters. They go through everything that we're going through until they're able to transcend any attachment and any delusion in this world. And Jesus, in a previous lifetime, had become completely freed from not only delusion, but from all karma. And then that made him, the, uh, made him free. He was a liberated soul. But very, very few liberated souls decide to come back and help others. Ramakrishna told a story of three men walking along and they saw this high wall and they heard all this laughter and joy coming from behind the wall and they wanted to see what was going on. So one of them boosted up another one and he looked in and he saw this beautiful garden, all these people just filled with joy and he was so taken with it that he jumped over the wall and went into the garden, leaving the other two. And so the second one boosted up, the, the, one of them boosted up a second one, and he too saw this beautiful, attractive garden, and he too jumped over and disappeared, leaving the third one. So he found a log, put it up against the wall, clambered up, and he too was very much wanting to jump over and be in, in paradise forever. But he thought, if I do that, who will help all the others who don't even know of the existence of this? And so denying that, he came back to help humanity. Now, there were only three of them, but this goes on with millions and millions who are freed jumping over the wall and saying, I've had enough. I've had enough of all that trouble and trial. As we say every week in the uh, Festival of Light, from a life of uh, tremendous joy and freedom in God, willingly to embrace limitation, pain, and death for the salvation of mankind. Such ever has been the choice of the masters for this world. So what is the consciousness that allows someone like Jesus or like any of our line of masters to choose to do that. Well, master told us, beautiful poem, God's Boatman. So imagine this is Jesus or master and complete freedom in God, complete everlasting joy. And then he says, I want to ply my boat many times across the gulf after death and return to earth's shores from my home in space. I want to load my boat with all those waiting thirsty ones who have been left behind, that I may carry them to the opalescent pool of iridescent joy, there where my father distributes his all desire quenching liquid peace. Oh, I will come back again and again, crossing a million crags of suffering, 
With bleeding feet I will come, if need be, a trillion times, as long as I know that one stray brother is left behind. I want thee, O God, that I may give thee to all. I want salvation, that I may give it to all. Free me then, O Lord, from the bondage of this body, that I may show others how they too can free themselves. I want thine everlasting happiness, but I want also to share it with others, that all my brothers may find the way to happiness forever and forever in thee. So that's the consciousness of these great masters. But so far, this has been kind of the outer story of Easter, you know, the drama. It's got to be one of the most dramatic weeks ever and one of the most widely known. And yet, if we remain only on the surface and don't see behind what was really happening, we'll miss the point of Easter for ourselves. So obviously, let's, let's look a little bit deeper. How did, how did Jesus free himself? Well, he freed himself by, as we heard in the Bhagavad Gita, by his consciousness being turned completely toward God until nothing else mattered, nothing else. There was no other desire. There was no other uh, attraction that made him do anything except seek union with God. And he went through, as, as Master explains, many lifetimes. And in a former lifetime, he and, um, and Sri Yukteswar were El Elias and Elisha, uh, prophets of, of Israel from centuries before. And so that, that great consciousness kept developing and developing until there was complete freedom. But then he came back, not just to go through a drama of Easter, he came back the same, because it was a changing of ages, it was in the depths of Kali Yuga, and a time had come when the way people worshiped God had to change, had to evolve from a rule-based um, law and discipline and um, uh, very, I, I don't know, structured way of worship to one of love and compassion and caring. And he was always in conflict during his lifetime with the powers because they were more rule-based and he was love-based. And he was bringing a new way of worshiping God, not the God of the Old Testament that was just waiting for you to make a, a, a mistake and then he was going to give it to you, but the God of the New Testament filled with love and joy and promise. So Jesus, too, was bringing a new way of worship, just as Master in this line of gurus is bringing a new way of worship in this age. And he gathered around this group of close disciples. And we think of the thought, oh, they were a little embarrassed and so on. But he was the, the sacrifice of Jesus uh, on the cross was actually him taking on the karma somewhat for the world, but primarily for his disciples. In our teachings, Master has said that the, his effort on our behalf, the Guru's effort on behalf of the disciple, is just as much energy of freedom as our effort is. And God's grace is another 50%. So all of our effort is matched by God. Well, we have to, Swami, in a deeper reading of this, he talked about the necessity for the disciples to go through their own trials because they have to become purified in order for their consciousness to be able to also 
go into freedom, go in. So all of us, we have to go through trials in order to do that. I don't want to make a comparison, but um, Davy and I and Diana and others, um, Ram, uh, spent a very difficult first winter trying to get the work established in Italy. It was very cold, coldest in a hundred years. For us, we had to leave, let our son leave, go back to America. We were separated. We had very little money, um, didn't speak the language. It was a difficult winter. When Swami came in the spring, he said simply, I know that that was difficult, but nothing great can be accomplished without someone's tapasya. And so if we want something to happen, if we want a higher consciousness, a resurrection, an upliftment for mankind, it's not that we have to suffer, but we have to do the tapasya that is needed to free us from our attachments and our desires. And without that, we cannot be really instruments for God. And so, so uh, Jesus in that lifetime, his sacrifice was in large part, Master said, to help release the close disciples from, from karma so that they had more spiritual power. And when he resurrected, he came and visited them. And that's the time of doubting Thomas. Thomas still wasn't quite sure that this was really a resurrected form. He said, put your finger in my, in my wound here. And then Thomas felt it, could finally believe. But Jesus wasn't there just to say, oh, see, I'm alive. He was there and he gave them the commission. They were given the power through their sacrifice and through Jesus' sacrifice to then go throughout the world spreading his teachings, spreading the teachings of this new way of worship which was needed. And so that was not only the, uh, one might say the resurrection of Jesus, but it was also the beginning of the dispersal of the teachings which we know as Christianity. Now, original Christianity honestly was much closer to what we practice than to what it was in the Middle Ages. It again became formalized. But that's why in this age, Jesus appeared to Babaji and said, send somebody to bring back my original teachings my original teachings of union with God. And so this drama of Easter in one way or another is like a metaphor that repeats and repeats and repeats. God comes at the time of some sort of darkness or at the time of the confluence of the proper timing of the ages. And he comes in the form of an avatar who takes on whatever role is necessary in that age. Master didn't have to suffer in the same way Jesus did with a capture and a death, but he had his own persecutions. He had his own misunderstandings. At one point, many of you know, he was giving um, talks, lectures in Miami, and the police commissioner who was a corrupt commissioner uh, was going to imprison him if he stayed. And master was going to stay there and fight being master. But then they convinced him that if he did, he couldn't carry on his lectures and his work. And a couple of months later, that commissioner was convicted of, of murdering people and, and was taken away. But Nonetheless, the point being that all these great masters, even if it's a relatively calmer incarnation, remember they've come from complete freedom and joy in God. And they have manifested into this world of duality where they're suffering even to have a body uh, on their level. 
So Jesus came, Master came, in order to help give us the proper teaching so that we too can be Christ-like. And so the teachings of this age that we have are teachings of being able to withdraw our energy, our life force, and direct it. It's the age of energy and direct it to and into the spiritual eye. And the essential difficulty of all people seeking God of all times is that their minds are scattered because they're drawn outward by desires and by attractions or, or repelling, being repelled by the world. The mind is scattered. And the practices that we have are to withdraw the mind so that it becomes stable in meditation. And when it can become stable in meditation, Master said, as his was, that he could sit instantly, look into the spiritual eye, and he could see, literally could see Jesus any time that he wanted. And he said, I can see him in the spiritual eye just as clearly as I see you sitting there. We all have that power. Master wasn't, none of these masters are saying, oh, I'm special and you poor people. They're saying, this is your potential. This is what you too can do. That's the real story of the resurrection of Christ because we are all carrying Christ consciousness. It just hasn't yet become resurrected in us. So these masters come in part to give us teachings, but more than that, they come for those who cling to them, as it said in the Gita, who, who, who see only them, want only them. The more that they do that, the more these masters come to empower us with their grace and they take on karma. Master said that he too took on the karma. The great masters who act in freedom, all of those miracles, all of the healings, all of the kindness, all of the compassion and support that Jesus did, that had its own karma. It came back, but because there was no ego there in Jesus, it came back and benefited his disciples. The same with Master. All of the goodness that he put out into the world, that, that sense, that energy comes out and it has to come back. But Master isn't there as an individual, as an ego to receive it. And so it is spread to all of those close disciples, most of all, but disciples, anyone who turns their energy to them, receives the grace of these great masters. And you and I are very, very blessed to be as close to the source of the, what we feel is the avatar of this age, to be that close to the source of that. And for most of us, to be dedicated also, as the disciples were, to doing the work of spreading the mission of God in the form of this master for this age. It's a very, very blessed life. And so we're not too unlike those disciples on the eve of Easter when God gave them, or when God in the form of Christ gave them the commission and the blessing, and the love, and the grace. Open your heart, and I will enter and take charge of your life. God bless you. Life cannot die, only death can meet death. In Christ resurrected, was the truth of Christ proved. 
in Christ resurrected was Christ's true.